The following program is a Town of Colony television production of the William K. Sanford Town Library. It goes all my life a circle, sunrise and sundown. The moon rolls through the nighttime till the daybreak comes around. And all my life's a circle, but I can't tell you why. Season spinning round again, the years keep rolling by. Top of the morning to you. I'm Joe Doolittle. And I'm Kate Dudding. And this is Story by Story. Celebrating the human spirit. With the emphasis on celebrating the human spirit, because that's what story really bubbles up from. It bubbles up from something that's really inside of people. At least I've always thought so. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and I think about all the things that can go on in a, in a good story. And um, basically, entertainment and a little learning. Enlightenment, too. I mean, learning, not necessarily book learning, but um, someone could be sharing an epiphany that they personally had or somebody else had had. That's or, true. Um, no. Now, we're using words here, folks, and, and storytelling is well, about and words. Well, gestures. And, and gestures. And that's what this show is all about. It's all about the art and method of storytelling in, in life, not so much only as a performance, but around your dining room tables, uh, at Thanksgiving, at places where families and people gather. We like to tell and listen to stories. Did I tell you about what happened to me yesterday? No. <laughs> oh, she was going to tell me a story. <laughs> so in terms of storytelling, what's the most interesting thing that you've been doing lately, Kate? Well, one of my Facebook friends, that's where I get a lot of my new stories. Oh, really? From Facebook. Facebook friends post an article that they've read about something that catches, catches my heart. Mm -hmm. It's more than my eye, it's my heart. Mm -hmm. And one of them posted that the rabbi of the Warsaw Ghetto during the Holocaust had been writing down his sermons that he gave, and he buried them in a container with a cover letter saying, please forward this to um, me in Israel or, or to uh, a Jewish organization in Poland. Um, God will take care of us. That's a very poor <coughs> paraphrasing. And after the war, a construction worker who was working on the foundation of a building, new building, to go over the rubble, found the container. Ooh. And this is a copy of, of that book that I got through oh, wow. Interlibrary Loan, The Holy Fire. And I just got it yesterday at the library, and I'm, I can't wait to read what this is this is like Anne Frank's diary right right a voice from the Holocaust and what was he telling he, uh, he had a special affinity with children what was he telling them that the story that I read was of a of a after the war another rabbi read the book and wanted to find some of the children that the rabbi from the Warsaw Ghetto had been interacting with. And he found one in Israel, mm -hmm. a, a man all hunched over from the abuse he got. Mm -hmm. Abuse isn't the right word, torture. Mm -hmm. He underwent as experimentation. He was a child mm -hmm. in, the, in one of the concentration camps. He was all pun uh, over. And the rabbi had told him, the most important thing is to be kind. And so when I was in the concentration camp after we were taken out of the ghetto, at night I would go around to people who were crying and, and hold their hands and listen to them. Mm. And now as a street sweeper, you can't imagine how many opportunities I get to be kind. Wow. So you're, you're always doing research, aren't you? I'm 
always trolling. Okay, okay. <laughs> so. And that's a pretty profound troll. I mean, that's a yes. that's a discovery of, yes. of, of some significance. Oh, no, it wasn't a Facebook friend. It was in Penina Schramm's book of Chosen Tales. Ah. That's right. And, and Penina, Penina Schramm is a famous Yiddish storyteller. Jewish. Y Yiddish Jewish. Uh, she started the Jewish Storytelling Center in Manhattan. Right, right. And is a lovely, charming, wise lady. And just received the National Storytelling Network's Lifetime Achievement Did Award. Did she? Good for her. Uh, in, Good for her. Uh, at the conference this year. Good for her. June. Good for her. Well, that's a, you know, that I, I'm not sure that I could top that. I, I, I feel like my own storytelling has kind of taken a sabbatical for the summer with travel. Uh, the, the, the ebbs and flows. Although I, I have a, my, my son, as you know, is a, is a minister and a physician, and uh, he had a sabbatical and, and put together a book of his sermons. Mm -hmm. It's called From the Pulpit to the Bedside. And uh, most of his ministry has been in inner city and his practice has been in inner city. And I've been reading those before I go to bed at night. I just kind of pull them off. And of course I know this person and I, and I know some of the stories and it's biblically based. But it is really nice to hear the echo of so much of your life in the story. And uh, we hear the echo of our lives and stories all the time. And that's one of the things that's attractive in a story is that when you're listening, it triggers something that is is part of you as much as it is the teller or the, or the story itself. Mm. I so like that's been think, fun. I like to think of it that people listen to stories through the filter of their lives, yeah. through all their lives' experiences. Yeah. Yeah. And so if you talk about your father, automatically your listeners are pretty much thinking of their father or, or some older relative right. and relating that way. Right. Sorry, Andrew. No, that's that's quite all right. I just, uh, but those were not as profound as the the, the rabbi of the Warsaw ghetto. Those are, uh, but they're they're meaningful and they're heartfelt, and uh, that's what stories can do for people. Mm -hmm. They can make you feel your heart. Mm -hmm. The most stories don't say, and therefore you must go forth and. I, I always try to stop just before that point, having given all the evidence, because I really do want these stories that I tell too. And the moral oh, is, cool. yeah. No, the, the, no. And also, well, you see that that's also limiting, mm. because somebody could be looking at it from a totally different way. Right. That the, the example I always think of is. I heard Carol Birch tell her hour-long performance about Lou Gehrig. Ooh. She had been looking for a story of a first generation who had made good. There you go. And then, so she wasn't a baseball person, but she was after she finished doing all the research. And there were all these things. But my takeaway, you see, this was the day we had dropped our son, our only child, off at college. And Mrs. Gehrig had not liked Lou's wife. And my takeaway was, whoever he brings home, I will welcome somebody that loves my son. <laughs> I'm sure that was a unique, pretty much a unique takeaway from, from that, that story. story. That story, that um, story. Well, you know, in, in terms of unique takeaways and, and, and stories that have heart and speak to our souls, we are really fortunate today to have one of well, I think you are in mind, one of our favorite storytellers. And persons. And persons, yes. She's, she's much more than just a storyteller. She's a friend. Um, and Karen Pillsworth is with us, and she's the poet laureate. No, storyteller. Storyteller laureate. I'm sorry, she's not a poet. No, I don't. <laughs> storyteller laureate of Kingston, New York. And, Woo! And, and I, I'm never sure how that happens, how one gets to be, but I know that she's really good at storytelling, so that must have something to do with it. And she's here with a relaxed attitude because... I hear that she's retired from her from her primary role as being a, a young person's teacher. Uh, well, her day job. Her day job. <laughs> Welcome, Karen Pillsbury. Well, thank you so much for having me. And, and I have retired, and it's a good feeling. Yeah. <laughs> we would have had you, we've had you once before. We would have had you more times, except... You're, you were busy most of the time during the days. We had to get you know get you in the summer, and you have 
a lot of summer reading programs too. So we're glad to have you for your second visit. I am very happy to be here, and I, I um, was looking back over those um, YouTube videos mm -hmm. of the first time, and I have to say that I had one little boy this year in my class, who every five or six years you get a little one who's in love with you. <laughs> and and Blass and I had a mutual admiration. And his mother came in one day and she said, every day we have to go to YouTube. <laughs> every day we have to watch you, Miss Karen, doing Betsy Bubblegum every day. <laughs> so obviously I had one admirer one, out there yeah, watching. <laughs> <laughs> we got a lot of hits on that one, I tell you. Yeah. Yeah. All from one little boy. One little boy, yes. I was very, very happy. He loved that story. <laughs> and, and, you you know, you, you tend to bring the kids, as well as your family, into your stories. So are you going to have to find another source of material for your storytelling? I think after 33 years, I will have enough material <laughs> to last me quite a while. Okay. I'm pretty sure that that's, uh, that's going to be the key. There. <laughs> Well, you know, she's probably right. She's probably got a lot of material. Yeah. Well, maybe some that she can use now that, that she's a little farther away. Uh. Right. Now, you did a wonderful thing that I was invited to and I couldn't get down to Kingston. You had a, a kind of a re retirement concert, a storytelling concert. And what a lovely thing to do. And because it, the proceeds benefited a new playground at the school, your school. Yeah, it was, and it was so much fun because, um, you know, I just said I wanted to do something to give back to school. All of the schools I worked in were great. And this last one was a Montessori school, a public Montessori school in our district. And I had been there six years, only six out of my 33 years, but it was wonderful. And I got to co-teach with my son, Sean Paul. Ooh. So for six years, we taught together. And uh, the first year it was- Well, that's a lot of stories there, I think. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> well, the first year out, you know, we had made the commitment that we would try it for a year because that could have gone either way. And it would have been okay with either one of us, but it really worked. So we, you know, we talked together for six years, and the last two, my granddaughter was also in the building, not in our class, okay. <laughs> because she wouldn't want to have Nona and Daddy be your teachers. No, that no, that no, would no, not no, be no. good. As a matter of fact, she wouldn't even look at us. She said, "When I'm here, I'm in school." <laughs> Okay. okay. Usually you have to wait until they're teenagers no. for that. This nope. is the attitude kid. Yes, yes. this is Tootie. <laughs> we love her. Um, but the school is really great, and we were getting a new uh, playground, which we did, and then an additional product from the Bruderhof community, which was a huge shed full of outdoor blocks and a wagon and a level so that when the kids were building, they were actually building and seeing how to construct something. So my money went towards additions to that, but I, um, three of my storytelling friends, Story Laurie, and of course oh. my storytelling partner, Lorraine Hart and Gilardi, and um, Jack McGuire, oh, who no. came out of retirement to tell, told with me, and then I told a story for each of my grandchildren, Cameron, Kagan, Violet, and Towns, and then at the end, they came up on the stage and told Mr. Wiggle and Mr. Waggle with me. Aww. So it was, yep. <laughs> and they um, they were great, and, and we had a really good time, and we, we raised some good money for the, for for the project. For yeah. what, a, so. what a wonderful way to retire. That just, uh, and there'll be echoes for that. Um, and even though it's probably not on YouTube, there'll be echoes of that, right? right. <laughs> and I did, I was, um, I was honored that the uh, mayor, um, not the one who appointed me Storyteller Laureate, but our new mayor, um, Mayor Noble, who's a um, wonderful, wonderful young man with lots of great ideas and is doing such wonderful things in the city. He came up, and it was a surprise to give me a little proclamation, and he read to me from Dr. Seuss's Oh, the Places You'll Go. Oh! And I got the bracelet to oh. go with it. Oh. So, um, from my other friends. So that was real. it was a surprise and it was really nice, but it was a great retirement gift to be able to do that. And and as I keep saying to people, it is truly a gift to be able to retire from something while you're happy doing it. Mm. So many people have to work 
beyond the happiness, even if they love their job. So, I mean, I was happy till the last day, but yet ready to go. Mm -hmm. You know, so there was, I mean, of course, I'm sure the first day of school in September, I'll feel a little tug. As I said to my husband, I went into Staples the other day. They had the 10 cent folders out. You know, you can only get 10 at a time. I'll go for 10, you go for 10. Then I'll go for 10, <laughs> and then they went, Oh my gosh, I don't have to go. <laughs> but it was like I walked in and that's what I thought. I gotta get the folders, gotta get the folders. It's a whole new world. Yeah, I don't have to get any folders. <laughs> do you, don't your grandchildren need any? They do, but I don't have their lists yet. Oh. Uh. As soon as I get their lists, I will I will go out and get the folders, but I don't have them yet. So Man. Oh. you can take this teacher out of the school, but <laughs> yeah, right. no, never out of you. Back, back up a bit for us, you know. I've always known you as someone who's a teacher and a storyteller, but when did you actually start realizing and, and, and being a storyteller? Tell us that story. I, um, I was, well, right here in Albany at the College of St. Rose when I was an undergraduate student. I had a professor, Sister Pat Kane, who uh, was my advisor and taught the oral interp class. Ah. And it was very serious. And she was a, a wonderful, amazing woman. And uh, she said, and now I hope you know that we will be doing a faculty night and each of you will be performing something for the faculty. Okay, now I was a kid who didn't talk until the sixth grade. I mean, I was shyer than shy, like nothing. And then I had a wonderful teacher who said to me, Karen, you're going to be in the oratorical contest. I didn't know what that was. <laughs> and she said, and it's for the archdiocese, and the, and the title will be The Role of the Layman in Today's Christian Society. I was 12. I had no <laughs> idea about any of that, but she got me talking. And then Sister Pat um, said, OK, now, Maureen, you'll be doing Shakespeare, and Suzanne, you'll be doing Chaucer, and Karen, you'll be doing Winnie the Pooh. For the faculty, sister, really? I mean, that's, I don't, there always is a children's lit piece. And you know what? I love doing Winnie the Pooh for the faculty. And I just knew that I wanted to, to tell stories. And she moved from the college after that, and she was in charge of the communications departments in each of the colleges. So every place she went, she would either have me on the radio or TV program. So as I progressed in learning stories, I got to go and tell them these different places because of her, because she invited me. So, Whoa. but she's the one who kind of pushed me out the door. <laughs> Whoa, that's 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 more than a mentor. That's uh, you. <laughs> And that's what she said. You will be here. I will, sister. I will be there. Yes, I will be there. <laughs> you will be there. Will be there. Well, it's hard to say no to nuns, it, usually. And it yeah. qualifies as more than a coach, somehow. Yeah. Uh, uh, <laughs> um, mm, yeah. The whole nominating committee. And, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, maybe we've talked a little bit about stories. Maybe we ought to have a story. And you could work up a story about her if you don't have one. <laughs> well, this, this story that I am going to tell does have a different nun in it. So I guess. Oh. The nuns have played a big role. I, I have said for a long time that I'm going to work on a story um, of the three sisters who did influence me, the one in elementary school, one in high school, Sister Elizabeth Ann, and then Sister Pat in college, and it's going to be called Three Nuns and a Sinner. <laughs> three, three nuns and, and a, a sinner. sinner. <laughs> Who's the sinner? Do I don't know. <laughs> but um, I will tell you this story. This one actually has um, a sister from my high school time. <clears throat> Once upon a time, and not so long ago, I was going on a job interview. Now, you can tell from the gray hair that this was not my first rodeo. So I, um, I, was, I woke up that morning, and I was nervous. And I, I wasn't really sure why I was nervous. I had been teaching a long time, and this was a job in a summer camp. But I woke up with that feeling in the pit of my stomach, that gnawing, biting feeling. And I, I thought, OK, well, I'll, I'll make this go away. So I got dressed. And uh, as I was getting dressed, I started to think about, and I don't know why, my permanent record. Now, if you went to school in the 60s, and especially if you went to Catholic school, you might know about the permanent record. For me, there was always some nun chasing me down the hall in the school saying, Miss Sangaline, if you're not careful, that will go on your permanent record. 
I didn't really know what the permanent record was, you know, but you get a vision. So my vision was that it was a file folder, it had my name on it, and of course in big letters it probably said, the permanent record, and it was in a file drawer somewhere, in a file cabinet. And if I wanted to go find out what was in there, I could, because after all, it is my permanent record. And then probably, you know, as you got older, like in high school, things went in there like your transcript and your letters of recommendation for college. Again, in the file, in the file cabinet, permanent record, you could see it. And then when you get your teaching job, you have a real file, and that's got all of your tenure observations and everything. But I always thought that I could access it because it was mine. But the morning I woke up for this interview, I had this terrible feeling that now my permanent record wasn't in a file cabinet. It was probably a little tiny icon on a computer screen. And because I am not so technologically savvy, I was pretty sure that I could no longer access my permanent record, but that everybody else in the world could. And that was the feeling I took with me when I went to the interview. I arrived early professionally dressed, and sat in the outer office. A woman opened the door and came and beckoned me in, offered me a seat across from her desk. She walked around and sat down. In the minute she took to walk around the desk, I, I looked around and I thought, okay, she's got papers, that's good, and photographs and frames, probably her family, and, and then of course there was a computer that faced her and I couldn't see, but I sat there gripping the sides of the chair and she said, <clears throat> I see here that you have wonderful letters of recommendation and an excellent resume. And you know, you feel yourself go, it'll be okay, it's all gonna be good. But then with one finger, she reached across and pressed a key on the keyboard. And she looked at this computer screen and she said, <clears throat> I see here that we have some things that we must discuss from your permanent record. You have my permanent record? Of course I do. I never interview anyone without looking at their permanent record. And I see here that you had some problems with alcohol in the seventh grade. <laughs> oh, I'm, I'm, no, I'm pretty sure that's inaccurate on my permanent record. And, and then I did smile and I said to her, oh, I have to tell you that story. We were going on our field trip to the Nun's Bazaar and my girlfriends and I thought it would be funny to take a little wine from our parents' liquor cabinets and put them in empty pill bottles and tuck them in our lunches and I don't know what we were thinking. There were like 500 nuns roaming the area. Did we think we weren't going to get caught? Of course we got caught, but it was just a joke. Mm-hmm she said, and she did that pursing thing with her lips. And she looked on the screen, and I see here, in the eighth grade, you threw a book out the second floor window and hit the visiting Monsignor on the head. <laughs> uh, well, I said, again, you know, it was eighth grade, we were getting to graduate from our little Catholic elementary school, and we were just kind of tossing things out the window, and I threw a book out, and well, hitting Monsignor Hicks on the head was just a bonus, it was a mistake, a mistake. <laughs> I, I did not mean to hit Monsignor Hicks on the head, and for a moment, I remembered, I remembered that day exactly. I remember him storming up the stairs and holding up the book and saying, who threw this out the window? Whoever threw this out the window, speak up now or no one will graduate. And there was perfect silence. And I wondered if kids today would have that same loyalty to their friends, but nobody spoke. It was just a joke, I said, I didn't mean anything. But she went on through my entire high school career. And then she said, and I see here, senior year, you pulled the male gym teacher into the girls' locker room showers. Oh. Oh, all right, I'll tell you about that. It's on my permanent record, you're sure? Yes, right here, on the permanent record. Well, you see, it was the last day of gym class. We were all completely dressed, and we all took Coach and pushed him into the shower. Now, Ann and I were standing closest, and so when he went in, we got wet, which would have been okay if we were in our usual green wool plaid skirts, but we were in our summer uniforms, lovely pastel shirtwaist dresses with a little straw belt with about 100 pinch pleats that had to be ironed every night. 
And well, when we finally got out of the shower, we looked like the Catholic schoolgirls version of the wet t-shirt contest. <clears throat> but, you know, we were going to class. We were good girls, and we were kind of squishing down the hall, water in our shoes, when we heard the voice from behind. Girls, come with me. We didn't have to turn around. We knew it was Sister Catherine. She took us to the elevator, and we knew that we were going down to the Dean of Discipline's office when she reached deep into the pocket of her habit, and she pulled out the key, and she placed it in the panel on the elevator door, and we knew we were going up, up to the convent. The doors opened. Anne and I stepped out. Sister Catherine did not and the doors closed, and coming down the long, dark hallway of the convent was Mother Mary Antoine, the oldest nun in the convent. They didn't even allow her to come downstairs. She walked with two canes. She wore the habit all the way down to the floor, face pushed back, and her her Coke bottom bottle glasses. It took her a long time to get down the hall, and when she did, she said, girls, come with me, and she took us to a room take off all your clothes. And we did. And she put them in this big industrial dryer, our uniforms, our underwear, our stockings, our shoes. And she gave us what I can only describe as nun wraparounds to wear. And then she pushed us out onto the roof of the convent, locked the door, and told us to pray for our very souls. It was a beautiful spring day. The boys were practicing baseball in the field. The sun was shining. If this was our punishment, we, we would take it. But I said, really? That's in my permanent record? You know, it was, we, were in, we were graduating. And I thought, is this whole interview going to come down to something I did in high school in 1974? But she didn't stop. No. All through my college days, how I had dressed the statue of Sister Rosa Mystica in a hula skirt. How I had dropped the keg in the bathtub and broken it. The bathtub, not the keg. And, and how I had tied the chairs in the library together on top of the table somehow after the library had closed one evening. But really, I said, none of these things should... I am not finished. I see here none of this ended when you began your teaching. What is this about the hairy man? Okay, I thought. She's got everything. I don't know how she has all this in my permanent record. I'm going to tell her this, and then this is done. I said, I'll tell you about the hairy man. I was a new teacher. I was teaching in a very poor school. And after that year, they transferred me uptown to where all the doctors and lawyers' children's went, children went. And I was maybe not as confident there, not with the kids, but with the parents. On the day of back to school night, we were readying the little kindergarten classroom and Nicholas started to cry. What's the matter? I have to come tonight, right? And I said, oh no, Nicholas, only the mommies and daddies are going to come. You get to stay home with your grandma. No, I have to come. I have to. And then I realized that Nicholas thought that I wouldn't know that his parents went with him. And I said, oh, Nicholas, what's the matter? You won't know my daddy. I will. Well, OK, you will. You'll know my daddy. He's hairy, hair all over his body, and he sleeps with my mother. Good, Nicholas. <laughs> I'm sure I'll know him. Well, that night, I stood before these parents who came in and folded their hands in absolute silence and looked at me as if I had some important knowledge to impart on them, which I knew I did not possess. So I thought, well, they're going to like me or they're not. And I stood. Good evening. My name is Karen Pillsworth, and I am your child's kindergarten teacher. And then I took a breath. And would the hairy man who sleeps with his wife please stand up? There was this gasp, and then Nicholas's dad stood up laughing, and so did everybody else, and I knew everything would be OK. But I said, really? That's in my permanent record? And I stood up and stretched out my hand. I can see that this interview is over. The woman stood. She looked at the computer screen one more time. And then she took my outstretched hand in both of hers, and she said, yes, this interview is definitely over. 
Welcome aboard. We have been looking for someone with your sense of humor and sense of adventure. And you can be sure that everything you do here will be dutifully noted in your permanent record. <laughs> oh my goodness. I love it. I and love it's it. I, I just always have to add to that end of that story that um one time, um, actually, the Reinhardt and Gillardi and I had a grant to work at the Children's Home of Kingston, and they're um, boys who had a really difficult time. And so we, you know, went in the first week, and we weren't really sure how it was going to go, and it was okay. And the second week, Lorraine couldn't be there, and I was by myself, all five feet of me, with boys who are like, you know, up to 21, who are six feet tall, and and I thought, I don't know, I don't know what to, do. I don't really know what to do. So I said, I'm going to tell you a story. And I told them that story. And one of the boys said, yeah, like she did anything like that in that story. And the other boy said, I think she might have. And they started to talk. And after that, they were willing to take a risk, not to tell me the most awful things they had done, but to tell me a little bit about themselves. Because I, those things were all true. I had told them things about me. Nothing horrific, but you know that I'm not a perfect individual, and I made mistakes, and I got in trouble, too. So you got it, caught a lot. And I yeah. did get well, caught a lot. Well, what she didn't get caught. <laughs> I was going to say, that what is, we only heard what she confessed, right? Yeah. Right. Oh, and I, I remember that your, your group, of, you had a circle of friends at college called the... Just let me get Waha. Yes. Yes. I, I always want to go woohoo, but I'm going, no, they're not the woohoo. Waha. They're the Wahas. And there was some story about breaking a wall in your dormitory. This, this goes was back that to not on your permanent record or you just know, not in the story? It didn't make it onto my permanent record, but you know, it's so much fun. You know how you had those thin walls? We were in an old house yeah. on you know Madison Avenue right here in Albany, and all of a sudden I went upstairs and Jean had her bottom on one side and her feet on the other, and she was crawling up to the ceiling. She goes, look at what you can do. It was like we were five. And all of a sudden, all of us were doing it. Well, the weight of all of us doing it went right through the wall. Wouldn't have been bad, but we went downstairs and did the same thing at another time. So we didn't really learn from our mistakes. <laughs> but yes, the Wahas, as a matter of fact, this month, the Wahas go to Wea Waka Weekend. <laughs> wait a minute, wait a minute. This so what are you going to do with the Wea Waka Weekend? With the Wahas? <laughs> Uh, I've met some of the, the Wahas because they've come to Story Sunday a couple of times and um, and they, they kind of you are a cheering section for each other a real source of encouragement and you're going to Weawaka do you guys know what Weawaka is? yes I'm going to be performing there cool. um, the last Tuesday in August well somebody it's, tell us the it's story a of Weawaka it's established for women factory workers from Troy over a hundred years ago. It's on the east side of the lake, just, just like a mile from the train station so the, so the ladies could walk. Ah. And uh, Georgia O'Keeffe was there one summer on a scholarship from an art school in New York City. And it's still going on. It's still going on. Men can come in July, but the uh, I think it opens on Memorial Day, closes on Labor Day, pretty much. And what will you be telling? What are I you? will be telling uh, stories of remarkable women. And we'll be there, I guess. Then, the, when what date is that? That's Tuesday. I think it's like Tuesday the twenty ninth. We'll be there right before that, yeah. that weekend right before mm -hmm. that, yes. So really, the Wahas go to Weawaka weekend is a story just waiting to happen. <laughs> Is this your well, first Wea Waka Weekend? It's so wonderful saying Wea Waka Weekend. <laughs> well, actually, last year we've always gotten together. Uh -huh. We're getting ready to celebrate um, our 40th reunion from college in 2018. And we've always gotten together every year. But last year we decided to go there. And for the first time in many years, um, one of our friends um, did pass away 10 years ago. But the remaining 14 of us were all there. Wow. So this year we won't have everybody that can happen every year, but there'll be 11 of us. So wow. I think that will be our tradition now. Uh -huh. Wahaz and Weawaka. Right. And, and, and is that how you registered with them? <laughs> that, that I, well, Wahaz go to the Weawaka weekend? <laughs> um, there was a group that I uh, had met at dinner once at Weawaka, and they were all knitters. 
and this every and and she brings the the the, the wine punch. Young and she brings <laughs> in little the, medicine the, bottles. Is that I the way they pack it? I don't know. know. <laughs> and you know, but I mean, they they this was a, a tradition, and they had it all scoped out. And dinner, which is really very fine there, was um, just part of their refreshments <laughs> and and what they did. A couple of, uh, I'm going to take a step okay. back yes. because uh, when we talked earlier about story and the power of, to teach and to entertain, um, that was an abstraction. But what just happened here in the last 10 minutes is you really heard the example of stories connecting life, uh, the story of the permanent record is, is a recounting of, of your experiences. It's it's done in a way that, that connects. You also heard that the story connected to a group of troubled youth and enabled them to open up a bit and, and, and share and get over some of the stuff that was holding them back. So when we talked about the, the nature of story, um, it isn't an abstraction. It's what we've lived in a way. And you can encourage these stories around your own tables. You can share them with your kids and your grandkids, but we encourage you to be more mindful of just the nature of how a story can can weave meaning into situations, whether it's a TV show or whether it's a We A Walk A Weekend. <laughs> and if there are, you still are fortunate enough to have elders in your family, <coughs> please ask them their stories and, and record them, because one day you'll want them. And even if you've heard them 50 times, by the time you're their age, you, it will not be quite so clear in your mind. And you will, you will want to have their own words. But, speaking of our own words, words uh, let's go on to the coming attractions. Storytelling that's happening around this area in September. And the first one is the day after Labor Day. Which is when you would be busy, busy, busy little beaver in schools. <laughs> On September 5th, we the first Tuesday Tales and Stuff with Dan Testo, and also a retired teacher. Recently retired teacher coming back to be more active in storytelling. <clears throat> and um, at Stories for a Late Summer's Eve. Right. And that's at Arthur's, that wonderful, charming little coffee house and market in Schenectady Stockade. So I encourage folks who want to just come and listen. That'll be a great opportunity to hear Dan and to tell your own story or sing your own song. And Joe has another series that he runs, Shawnakee Evenings at the Irish American Heritage Museum on Broadway in Albany. That will be starting up in October from its summer break. And then there's just one more of the Not Just for Kids Storytelling Sundays at Schoharie Crossing with one of the founders of Story Circle, the local guild. It's free. It's on September 10th at 6 p.m., rain or shine, with Becky Holder. And that's going to be a very memorable evening, I think. And, and uh uh, Schoharie Crossing is certainly one of the best kept secrets in the area. It's a beautiful place just uh, west of Amsterdam on the south side of the Mohawk. Um, I encourage folks to get out there and, and listen to Becky and just experience the place. Yes. And Becky was also a teacher and she has a wonderful thing, a wonderful story. I don't know if she's going to tell it then. Uh, things I learned in kindergarten as a kindergarten teacher. I won't. <laughs> She was going over shapes with with her students to see what they knew, and you know, circle, triangle, and yeah, so she, one little girl, this is a, that's a circle, that's a triangle, that's a square, and then she held up a rectangle, and she the, she looked and said, almost a square, <laughs> and then she with another student. She got to that same rectangle. Apparently, that's that's, that's a that, tough one. That's a tough one, and this student said. Pop-Tart. <laughs> <laughs> That's just a little little teaser. I don't know if she's going to tell that, but she tells wonderful stories. Then the Interfaith Story Circle will be um, holding their September event on September 11th 
and check their website. It's a new website. Uh, their parent organization is now called withourvoice.org. And you can find out all about Interfaith Story Circle by going to withourvoice.org slash IFSC. Interfaith Story Circle. IFSC. And that program is going to be uh, facilitated by yours truly. Oh, really? And uh, the uh, the feature is Harlan Ratmar, who's the chaplain at Albany Med, uh, and his program's going to be on the power of stories to heal and comfort. Um, and Harlan is is renowned as a storyteller and as a minister, and is quite effective in the way he uses the language. So that will be a good program. Sure. Okay. And where will that be? Uh, that's going to be in the Hike Auditorium at Albany Medical Center. Albany Medical Center. Okay. That's good to know. Uh, that information was going to be coming to me on Monday, which was a little late. But having have a Betsy. And this is a very important year for the Interface Story Circle. It's their 25th anniversary. Mm. So all of their programs are going to be the power of stories to do such and such. Mm -hmm. And they even have a new logo, which I have to add to the, the, um, the what you're seeing. And, and you, now you see it. Uh, <laughs> moving right along. Uh, I'm their webmaster and general geek, volunteer geek. You keep their permanent record I, I, you know, there? No, no, no. Guri, uh, one, of, one of the uh, other supporters of it, is the graphics designer. But I do things like she gives me a PDF file and I make them into JPEGs and, you know, geek. Okay. Then another storytelling series in the area is the Saratoga Storytelling Open Mic, which will be happening, uh, as always, on the second Wednesday of the month, which will be September 13th, 7 to 9 at Cafe Lena. At the new Cafe Lena. At the new Cafe Lena with the new elevator mm -hmm. finally working. I mean... Uh, installed. I mean, it wasn't that it was, they had problems. It was just the installation took a little time. And the feature teller is to be determined. The next story circle meeting, which is our guild meeting, will be right here in Colony Town Library on Tuesday, September. <laughs> on what you see on the screen, I'm not sure that date is right because uh, those dates don't really add up. Um, six to eight, sharing stories under development, telling no reading, please. Listeners are very welcome. Mm. Moving right along. Um, and then we're starting up our series at Proctor's okay. to get our 11th season there of word plays. Well, again, stories celebrating the human spirit. And the first topic is going to be awakening on September 24th at 2 p.m. in the Fenimore Gallery, which is on the second floor right above the box office. You take the elevator. You take the elevator. <laughs> so you go to the box office, you turn right around, and oh my goodness, there are two elevators there. I wonder where they go. They go up and down, like <laughs> elevators do. And then even though this is, we were talking about September, but October 1st, that's almost September. If September had 31 days, it would be. It would be, right. At 125th Story Sunday. 125. Um, thing, uh, bumps in the night. And it's with, oh, it's with Barbara Chapitis, who used to be one of the sniggering witches, or snickering witches. <laughs> sniggering, I think. And Mary Murphy. So I'm looking forward to that. I, that, that would, that would start off the holiday, the Halloween month, if you will. Right. And then we have our seasons planned out. So we have uh, five story Sundays, five word plays, and a celebration where Karen Pillsworth will once again be our charming MC. MC. Um, she always does a wonderful job. She volunteers for it. It's just so super. And the topic this year is challenges. And then finally, if you can't find something on TV or you need, you, 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 you can't get a hug, but you really want to feel better, 
go go find one of our stories online. Go to storycircleatproctors.org, click on YouTube. We have over 200 stories on demand that you can watch. Many of them taped right here in the studio on the second floor of the Colony Town Library. And we're very grateful that they do this for us. And to Greg Rosinski, who is the station. Uh, <laughs> He does all of that stuff for us, and very kindly, and that's, and professionally. That's true, and you know, Kate, that's quite a lineup you've organized, or we've organized, I must <laughs> say. Um, and uh, it's it's around the area, and if you uh, if you hear about things, uh, please email us and tell us about other stuff that you may think of that you found that might be relevant for us to tell people about. Boy, oh boy. We have... 125. Right, 125. Did I tell you I bet on 125 to one shot at Saratoga <laughs> yes. and it came in? Did I tell you about that? Yes, yes. Just thought I'd slip that in there. I yes, yes. I'm sorry, you were, you were saying. Um, we have about 14 minutes left. Do you have another story, Karen Pillsworth, storytelling laureate <laughs> of Kingston, New York? I do have another story, but first I do want to say that I am so thankful for the two of you and for all that you do and I'm so excited now that I'm retired that even though Kingston is not far away I couldn't get to a lot of the things that were here and the meetings and everything so I am grateful that you're still doing everything you're doing and that I'll be able to come and be more well, a part we'll of it. Well welcome you too. <laughs> yes. For sure. Thank you. Um, yeah, so this is a, a smaller story, and um, this is the one that um, at my storytelling concert was for my grandson Towns. He's uh, the number three in the line, Towns. And uh, so this is a story for him, about him. <clears throat> it was time for Towns' first overnight at his Nona's at his grandma's house, and he was very excited. He packed a little suitcase, he just put his jammies and his toothbrush in it, and he arrived early in the afternoon. And of course, we played outside, because that's what we like to do. So we drew with sidewalk chalk, and we blew bubbles, and we rode our bicycles, and then it started to rain. And Town said, oh, Nona, do we have to go inside now? No, said Nona. I'm going to teach you a game that only Nona's who grew up in the 60s know how to play. It's called playing Woodstock. And then Towns and I slid in the mud on our bellies. We were covered in mud. We made mud pies. Oh, it was great. But eventually it was time for dinner. So we went inside and we showered off and had dinner. And then I said, OK, Towns, now it's time for bed. So get into bed, and I'll tell you a story and kiss you goodnight. But Town said, Nona, I don't have a bed here. Now this is your part. You have to go like this. What? Ready? What? <laughs> oh, what? Cried Nona. Well, Nona went right outside and she cut down some trees. She took them downstairs to the basement. She sawed and she hammered and she painted and she made a beautiful bed and she put it upstairs for Towns. And she said, OK, Towns, now it's time for bed. So get into bed. Put your head on your pillow, and I'll tell you a story and kiss you goodnight. But Nona, I don't have a pillow here. What? Cried Nona. So Nona went right out to the hen house. She picked up all the feathers the chickens had dropped. She stuck them into a pillowcase. She sewed it up. She fluffed it up, and she put it right on Town's bed. And then she said, OK, Town's, now it's time for bed. So get into bed. Put your head on your pillow. Pull up your blanket, and I'll tell you a story and kiss you goodnight. But Nona, I don't have a blanket here. What? <laughs> Cried Nona. So Nona went right up on the hill where the sheep were. She sheared the sheep. She carded the wool. She spun. She knit. She dyed. And she made a beautiful blanket of periwinkle blue and put it on the bed. OK, Towns, it's time for bed. So get into bed. Put your head on your pillow. Pull up your blanket, hug your teddy, and I'll tell you a story and kiss you goodnight. But Nona, I don't have a teddy here. What? what? Cried Nona. Well, Nona was tired. She was really <laughs> tired. So she just tore down a curtain from the living room, and she cut out a pattern of a little teddy bear. She stuffed it. She sewed it. She put on two button eyes and a little red bow tie, and she said, Towns, 
It's time for bed. Get into bed. Put your head on your pillow. Pull up your blanket. Hug your teddy. And I will tell you a story and kiss you goodnight. But Nona, said Towns, it's already morning. What? what? Cried Nona. Well, Nona got right into bed next to Towns. She hugged him really tight. She told him a story, and they slept until noon. And that's the story about Towns' first overnight. <laughs> and he loves it, I have to say. He loves it. And, you know, again, most of that's true. We do like to play in the mud. I have pictures of all of my grandchildren playing in the mud. And, and you call that playing Playing Woodstock. Woodstock. Because if you went to the festival, you were covered with mud. So that's what we call it, playing Woodstock. I love it. I love it. Oh, all those things she didn't mention on her permanent record. <laughs> oh, oh man. my goodness. This is a new file. The new file. No, this one's going right on the computer. It doesn't even get into the file cabinet, right? So. Oh, <laughs> I love playing Woodstock. I, you know, I, my ki grandkids are too young, for, too old for that now. Although maybe they're not too old to go to Woodstock. That's <clears> another <throat> problem. But anyway. <laughs> uh, holy crow. Holy crow. So you've created... And a story for each of your grandchildren? I, you know, used some basis, as we all do, of other stories. So, <clears throat> pardon me. Um, so, Cam's Wubba is a version of um, something from nothing, which everybody has a, a version of. And his is his blanket that gets turned into all the things. And then at the end, he realizes that he can write a story from his own imagination. Uh -huh. um, Kagan's the, the wild card, um, who loves me, I know he does, because he'll say to his mother, uh, Nona is my best friend, Nona is and so best. I want to go to her house. And last year when he was really making his, other, his older brother a little um, aggravated, he put him right in a box, and he said, I'm sending you to Nona's. <laughs> <laughs> This is his two-year-old brother? Well, he was three at the, yeah, he was three, yeah. So Cameron's the older one, he put Kagan in the box. Five-year-old. Yeah, three three-year-old, three -year going to Nona's. Um, so Kagan's Did is... leave some breathing room? Yeah. Okay. He's kind. He's a very kind boy, as a matter of fact. Um, so Kagan's is a version of uh, the squeaky bed, you know, where you put in the, the cat to sleep with and the, the dog. The squeaky door. Yeah. So his is the squeaky yeah. door. I Thank you. I was reminded of that when Nona was getting more and more tired. I went, oh, yes, just like a boy. Uh, <laughs> yes, exactly. So that, and then Violet's, um, she's the only girl, and she takes ballet. So hers is about um, getting her first tutu, Violet's oh. tutu. Oh. So yeah, so they each had um, a story at my concert, and they had a little shirt that went with it. And Violet did have the tutu. I did get her the tutu to go with it. As a dancer, you know how important the costuming is. Yes. <laughs> yes. yes. Um, so it's fun that they each have a story. <laughs> I have, a, I have another project for you. Yes. Well, I just think Nona is My Best Friend would be a great memoir book for you. Oh. I, I just, you know, and you've probably got it already started, but, um, and you could weave into it, you know, how you match stories to people in terms of uh, without a permanent record and, you know, kind of things like, but just, just a great line, Nona is My Best Friend. I have to remember. Now I have to remember that. That's me. <laughs> Write that down. <laughs> well, it'll be on the YouTube. That's so right. I can go was, back. Joe said something important. Now, what was <laughs> what it? What was it? <laughs> yeah. Oh, there it is. Remember, near the end. Right. Near the end. So, now that you are retired from your, what I think of as your day job, though you might have, might have thought of that as your first vocation or something, do you have plans to to expand your storytelling? Or I'm also Karen's webmaster, so I see her <laughs> calendar. And <laughs> I am. Uh, I'm very excited. Um, I've some of the traditional things that I've always done, of course, the Huli on the Hudson, which we're back at this year, which I'm very excited mm -hmm. about, which is the Sunday before Labor Day in Kingston, down on the Rondout. And you've been performing at Mohunk? 20 years. 20 years. Yes. I was there last night. It's, it's just the most wonderful place. If you haven't been to Mohunk, uh, <clears throat> the historic site in um, New Paltz, New York, it's absolutely amazing. So yes, I've been very lucky and just got my fall contract, so... I'm happy to continue that. Send uh, me the dates. <laughs> I, yes. 
Um, and then um, I have to switch from being Irish to Italian <laughs> for the Italian Festival in October, which is on the same day as our Forsyth Nature Center. So I do them in the morning and the Italian Festival in the afternoon. Um, and Italian is really my heritage. Mm -hmm. but, you know, I'm Irish by injection. <laughs> <laughs> by marriage. <laughs> um, and um, so, I, and I have gotten some, some things. I'll be up in the um, Onondaga School District telling stories. So I'm able to do things now during the day. Ah. And I'm hoping to work up some, um, some other programs. One, um, storytelling and mindfulness, mm -hmm. which is um, something that I was, uh, we were working on in the Kingston School District through the um, School of Empathy. Mm -hmm. And programs that we were um, working on to work with some of our kids making transitions to middle school. Uh, but it's it's a new burgeoning program, but I'm still staying part of that. Mm -hmm. And so I want to take that, develop a program, and take that into schools. Wonderful. Hopefully, I think that it's, well, I know it's the hot topic, so I, yeah, you know. Yeah, my, yeah. But I, you know, for me, it's. You weren't it's, born yesterday. Yeah. <laughs> I know it's, um, it's very important. But okay. um, I have to say, though, on a little aside, all of my retired friends have said to me that you must do something on the first day of school when the kids go back to school, the first children's day back at school. Like a friend said, I loved golf, so I went golfing, you know. So I know that there's always a Kingston retired teacher's luncheon, so I thought, well, I'll go and I'll see all the friends who've retired. But a couple of my friends said, no, you're not going to that. I go, okay. And they have a tradition, which I didn't know about, about the school that I retired from, George Washington, where the the teachers who recently retired take any new retirees, and this year I'm the only one from my school, and um, we go to New York City, and we go to lunch, and we go see a play. Whoa. Uh, and I haven't been to see to the city to see a play in forever, and we're going to see Come From Away. Oh, oh Come From Away. I'm looking oh. forward to oh. that. Yeah, so I'm very excited because I told in Newfoundland, so I am very you know, excited to see the play for many reasons. I've heard some of the music, and... Of course, the story is just wonderful. So that's what I'll be doing on the first day. When all of my grandchildren go to school, <laughs> I'll be going to see the play. So I'm really Come excited. Come From Away is the story about the planes. 9-11. Yeah. Yeah. That had to, yeah. couldn't enter the airspace here. Yeah. And, had and to how land. they were welcomed. Yeah. I think there were equal numbers, villagers, you know, in this area and people. It was, it was a tremendous yeah. um, effort. To, to feed and, and house mm -hmm. all, those all people. these people. Um, yeah. Come from and life. then at one plane, a fellow said, I think we should do something for them, when they finally were on their way yeah. to home. And he said, I think we should start a fund to help the kids go to college. Wow. Yeah, it's, it was, it's pretty amazing. So I really am looking forward to that. Mm -hmm. So, but yes, I do hope to be doing um, things that I couldn't do before and to be, be able to come and attend meetings and story circle and then also to, to travel a little more. And, you know, the, I mean, this summer is great. And, you know, today I'm here and then I'll be up at Timberlock in the Adirondacks and next week I'll be um, in Maine and the following week I'll be in Vermont. So And then you'll be at Weawaka. And then I'll be at Weawaka. <laughs> For the weekend. <laughs> yeah. With the so, <laughs> so, you know, I'm very... Um, I'm very excited because I, I have been lucky to have two careers, two vocations that I love. And so leaving one is okay because yep. I have this one. You know, I didn't, a lot of people don't retire, they tell me, because they're very afraid of what comes next. Or they're very afraid they don't know how they'll fill their time. And I always said I could barely fit work in. <laughs> so for me, filling my time is not going to be an issue. And I transition seamlessly into I'm now a full-time storyteller. It, it's, it's always summer, except, <laughs> except the weather does change. But. <laughs> it's always summer. So it's time for us to say goodbye. Well, this has been a delightful hour. I want to thank Karen and you for adding so much spice and interest to the conversation. And we'd like to thank you for coming and spending the time with us, and we hope you'll come back again. Good cheer. Thank you. It goes all my life's a circle, sunrise and sundown. The moon rolls through the nighttime. 
till the daybreak comes around And all my life's a circle But I can't tell you why Season's spinning round again 